Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, joining. So uh, this symposium is entitled Reconstructing Beirut. We will discuss uh, how the reconstruction of Beirut uh, is happening and uh, explore different positions from different speakers. Um, and so uh, we will have four sessions. Um, uh, the first session will introduce the context for those who are not familiar with it, uh, especially uh, regarding things that have been happening uh, in the last uh, two years. Uh, and then we will look at uh, urgency and activism and how uh, the community has responded to the urgency uh, that uh, the context has uh, placed on the population, but also uh, the blast. Uh, and then we will explore different uh, positions from different speakers regarding how the reconstruction should happen and what it projects onto the population. Um, yeah, and then uh, in the closing conversation, we will try to recap and explore how uh, architects can play a role in this reconstruction and uh, how actually uh, important it is. Um, so the first session will be chaired by Philip, who is here on the call. Uh, and the second will be chaired by Judy. So um, I think now it's time to have a minute of silence for those who died in the explosion. Uh, and then after that, we can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you everyone. Philippe, I'll make way for Philippe now to introduce the first session. Um, hi everyone, um, and welcome to the very, very exciting first session of uh, the symposium, um, which is in a way a continuity of the great um, interest of the Lebanese community at BAA in the mobilization of ideas and resources for um, the rethinking of Beirut and Lebanon as a whole. Um, so, as some of you might already know, yesterday marked seven months since um, the explosion of Beirut, of the port of Beirut, um, and the truth is still not, not out there, justice is still not served. So this first session, in a way, goes back um, to the moment of the blast and its aftermath, to explore the different depth of it by bringing speakers from both Lebanon and abroad to understand the different uh, repercussions and responses to it. Um, so before we start, um, I want to tell um, everyone here that if you have any questions, um, just ask them in the in the Q and A section, um, and we'll have time to answer those questions after the presentations. Um, so the first speaker I want to introduce is uh, Sibyl George, who is a Lebanese architect uh, based here in London and um, a founder and director at Impact Lebanon, which is an amazing, amazing initiative that was born from the Lebanese uh, diaspora. Uh, to the to the Lebanese diaspora, um, and um, so being from the the diaspora myself and having worked for a short amount of time with them, I could speak about their amazing work for for hours. But I will let her do the talking. So please welcome Sibyl. Uh, Sibyl, the, the the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see it? Great. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm Sibyl. Uh, as you said, I, 
I'm one of the co-founders and directors at Impact Lebanon. I'm going to start by give you by giving you a small context about Lebanon in general, and then we're going to move into mobilization um, in times of crisis, and particularly in the context of Lebanon. So, um, sorry, yeah. So um, Lebanon has reached an unprecedented level of crisis. There has been 30 years of mismanagement, corruption, clientelism, and sectarianism, and that have caused the state to reach a debt of uh, $90 billion, which to put in perspective, ag accounts for about 170% of our GDP. And to compensate for this, the central bank borrowed money from commercial banks through financial engineering, or what the press has labeled a Ponzi scheme. And so a big percentage of that total government debt was therefore owed to local banks. Unfortunately, the burden of all of this fell on the Lebanese people who have seen their country deteriorating and the government showing um, very little will for reform. So until this day, the Lebanese people are still met with terrible inflation rates um, the, on, on basic commodities. There's the collapse and devaluation of the local currency. Money withdrawals are limited on bank depositors and employment rate is at its peak. And to top it all, obviously, there's the pandemic that we're all um, experiencing right now. And so um, in October 2019, there was a popular uprising that started and it brought all of those issues to light and called for an immediate change in the system. And on the second day, um, protests erupted all around the world with the diaspora mobilizing to support the movement that was back home, including here in London. And so this is when actually my co-founders and I met. We met on chats in the streets of London and through mutual connections. What drew us to one another was really that eagerness to be part of the change, but more importantly, we wanted to drive change in the country. And so in October, 15 to 20 of us met and each stepped in to fill a gap where was needed, starting with the protests. Um, this could have been making a poster, announcing a protest, writing the speeches, uh, calling the police uh, for, for the protest, etc. cetera. Um, and so people started reaching out to understand how they could contribute. And th those were clearly unprecedented times. Um, and we saw an opportunity to bring the diaspora together and create a community that would act as a home for them. And gradually this group grew by identifying other key needs. A subgroup would meet to create a website for the revolution, another one to do a 10,000 pound fundraiser for the end of year holidays, another one um, would start creating awareness videos about what was happening in Lebanon. The mobilization was really everywhere. Here in London, we found we founded Impact Lebanon, which um, officially got its name in December 2019. But there were many other organizations and initiatives that actually um, also started to be created, including Mishtemain Mechterbin and more recently Art for Beirut. And there are many of them uh, that have had an amazing impact back home. Um, and I can only, only speak about Impact Lebanon because I've had firsthand experience with it. Impact Lebanon wouldn't be what it is today and wouldn't exist without um, its members. Um, Impact Lebanon is first and foremost a family of people that are mobilized every week during their free time um, to put their skills at use to drive change in Lebanon. And today we have about 100 volunteers within a community of 300 people. They're really spread um, around the globe and they work on a dozen of initiatives in various sectors. I'm just going to show you some of them. Um, so there is the Kene, which is an online concept store whose mission is to help local artisans and, crafts and craftsmen export their products. There's the Environment Academy that was, that was launched with the AUB Nature Conservation Center and Saril Wa'at, where subject matter experts in the diaspora mentor initiative and municipalities so that they can become more sustainable. Um, there's on the education side, there's the mentorship program that links mentors with um, recent graduate uh, young professionals and students who are actually who want to apply for jobs. So they help them with CVs um, through uh, different sessions. There is EduPact, our latest initiative that puts in contact teachers um, with students that are disadvantaged, um, children that are disadvantaged and that cannot get a quality education. Um, and there is a laptop drive to help the younger generation study uh, during the pandemic because there is a short, like people are not able to by computers right now. On the cultural side, there's also Terbilab, which is all about Lebanese history and Juzuri that celebrates Lebanese cultures. But one of the most impressive 
impressive forms of mobilization um, came after the August 4 explosion. Um, at Impact Lebanon, a couple of hours after the blast, we launched a disaster relief fundraiser with an initial target of 10 to 50,000 pounds. Donations began pouring in, um, but little did we know that news of this crisis would travel far beyond Lebanon's border. The videos and pictures started circulating around the world and moved the Lebanese diaspora and international communities alike. And so in less than 48 hours, we had been shared by millions around the world, including uh, some public figures, starting with Bella Hajid, which led us to reach an outstanding at 6.5 million pounds by 170,000 donors. With raising so much money came an immense role of ensuring transparency and resourceful and strategic allocations of funds. And so um, the structure that was in place allowed for the same type of organic mobilization to happen. And for that, we're honestly forever grateful to all of the different teams and people that mobilized themselves. Um, there was a team that worked on assessing the needs on the ground to ensure that funds would be allocated in the most sustainable way. Another team started reviewing hundreds of proposals from NGOs and selected and vetted those targeting the needs that were identified by the first group. Um, another started working to ensure that the funds would reach Lebanon despite the capital control. We've had as well the marketing and um, communication team that uh, ensured that everything would be communicated to the audience in the most transparent way. And finally, the, we currently have a mobilize, uh, sorry, um, monitoring team that's that, that, that is constantly in contact with the NGOs to ensure that the money is spent responsibly. And there's also the mobilization team that makes sure that we're always recruiting for new volunteers and that they are actually, um, they, they join the right team um, when, I mean, and, and they work on whatever they want to be working on. And there has been similar movements in Lebanon. More and more NGOs working, started working to fill a gap that was identified with the civil society and the Lebanese people mobilizing to help one another. Given all of the crisis Lebanon is facing, NGOs are unfortunately feeling, filling more and more gaps. Um, and while we should work with one another toward driving change in Lebanon, we need to be very careful about the trap of becoming what um, Mona Haleb and Wafa was labeled a republic of the NGOs. And so um, in our opinion, the goal of an NGO shouldn't be to become larger with time. And on the contrary, our aim should be uh, that the number of people needing us decreases. And for that to happen, we need to go to the root of the problem. And so if we want fundamental change in Lebanon, we need Lebanese people in Lebanon and abroad to start to become active citizens. Part of it is voting, part of it is empowering the alternative parties on the ground. And so the next big wave of mobilization uh, for is actually um, is actually active citizenship. And during the last election, over half of the population did not vote. And what is even more shocking is that we're one million eligible voters outside of Lebanon. Only eight of us registered to vote, and only half of those that registered actually voted. Voting is the most crucial demographic right we have, and it is becoming clear that the solution requires channeling energy and engagement with politics. This is the focus of two other initiatives at Impact Lebanon. So the aim of Saudi on one side um, is to encourage Lebanese people everywhere in the world to be politically engaged active citizens by providing a resource through which they can learn about and engage with alternative political, political groups, learn about um, how Lebanese politics work, um, join a movement to spread awareness among Lebanese communities everywhere and ultimately access all information they need about elections when they happen. And a big part of political engagement and active citizenship involves learning more about various political topics that are divisive in Lebanon. And so Wish at Nazar is an initiative that organizes these uh, regular debates and discussions to showcase different point of views among activists, alternative political groups, um, academics, experts, and more importantly, to encourage that healthy debate in Lebanon. And I want to end on a quote, actually, um, which says, if a movement is to have an impact, it must, it must belong to those who join it and not those who lead it. And the reason I want to end with that is because if the last year has taught us something, it is really the power of communities who work toward a single goal. And I think that we should all do that for Lebanon. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Sibyl, for this presentation. Um, I think we'll have time to discuss it um, afterwards. Um, the next, um, the next, uh, the next speaker I want to introduce is Kishan San, who is an AA alumnus currently working at Forensic Architecture here in London um, on various spatial investigations. So Forensic Architecture has done an extremely interesting analysis of, Be of the Beirut port explosion. Um, and Kishan will, will elaborate a bit on that. So please uh, welcome Kishan. I'm just gonna share screens. Can you see? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. It's a fantastic initiative that you guys are setting up. Um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I'm Kish, one of three forensic architecture researchers who worked on the Beirut investigation. Um, so for those of you who don't know, forensic architecture's work focuses on conditions of conflict. So for example, this is a case, a steal from a case of police violence in Chicago. Um, and we investigate incidents that are captured across different media forms, which we map, analyze and model with a view to expand and unlock information embedded within the frame of an image. So here we cross-reference multiple sources to triangulate the precise position of each actor within the scene. And finally, we'll prepare a report on our findings um, in order to expose certain facts in a given forum. Wait, sorry guys. So Forensic Architecture is an independent research agency based at Goldsmiths University of London, utilizing spatial and media analysis to investigate state and corporate violence worldwide, from war crimes to violations of human or environmental rights. We're now a team of around 20 people from various backgrounds and disciplines, including architecture, filmmaking, journalism, art, programming, etc. It's important to view the Beirut investigation in the context of an ongoing body of research into the politics of clouds. So that includes the use of herbicidal spray to conduct a practice of Israeli ecocide in Gaza, um, the use of white phosphorus in urban environments, and the use of tear gas in protests across the globe, and many, many more. So cloud is a visible mass of gaseous matter, often emitted or made visible when a material has undergone a physical transformation. In this sense, it's a trace of an event or an incident. And the study of such evanescent forms necessitates a different approach. As clouds are dynamic and governed by nonlinear logics, their forms are elusive and difficult to determine at any moment. So successful capture and representation of clouds is a problem that's occurred historically through schistel painting, where clouds were moving faster than the painter could capture them. But today, with the advent of smartphones, we're able to capture images of 30 frames a second. Social media platforms allow us to distribute these images immediately. And with 2D and 3D editing software, we're able to pass and analyze each frame. So today we can really unpick, unravel and analyze these forms. And in the hours that followed the explosion, we'd see a mass of videos, photos and testimony circulating on social media, including doctored imagery annotating a missile attack that led to the explosion. But the open source investigators at Bellingcat and Newsy quite quickly debunked these sources and the full picture of the state negligence leading to the disaster faded into focus. The following week, Madame Massa contacted us to begin a collaborative investigation and through open source investigative techniques, we're able to build a library of sources depicting the clouds and the incident itself. And as with our previous cloud study projects, we sought the consultation of experts. In this case, Gareth Collett, a UN explosives analyst with a specialism in homemade makeshift bombs to help us unpick the footage frame by frame. In an initial interview, he confirmed that the red cloud was likely the combustion or explosion of ammonium nitrate. But more importantly, he gave us two key entry points that would become the basis of the investigation. So the first one um, was that the chemical composition of the material determines the color of the cloud it produces when burning. So for example, 
each different colored plume indicates the combustion of a different material. The second point they gave us was that the spherical shape of the sphere indicates a single point explosion, i.e. the ammonium nitrate stored inside the warehouse was stored at the center of this sphere. So we go on to produce a detailed report for us outlining an estimation of the amount of ammonium nitrate stored inside the warehouse based on the blast radius and confirming the above in numbers. And with that direction, we really set out to determine the different cloud types as well as the locations from which they originated. So in order to start to piece together the sequencing of the event, we chronolocated, which means to place in time each source to build up a temporal collage and discern the different phases and transformations the plume underwent. So the plume itself acts as a three-dimensional clock, which is in continuous transformation with a unique but discernible shape at each frame. And by cross-referencing each source and using temporal markers such as the spherical explosion and this initial flash of light from the blast, we could align each video temporally. So this is what's playing in the background here is what our working sync file looks like. And during this process of collection and assembly, studies are done really, really quickly um, to try and piece together things as more information comes in. And this is simply done in the Adobe software After Effects, um, which of course works very well for syncing footage and analyzing media frame by frame. So using an open source 3D model of Beirut City created many months before the incident and widely circulated after the incident, we were able to start geolocating each source. Here, um, we use spatial markers distributed in the city and the horizon line to calibrate a given footage's camera or cone of vision. And 3D models is like a key, key tool for us, which really allow us to synthesize data points, aligning satellite imagery, videos, images, and more data into one environment, building a spatial account of the incident. So by chrono and geolocating imagery, we're trying to unlock information beyond the boundary of the frame and in doing so demystify the event itself. <laughs> So we're able to identify four phases to the cloud. The first plume at 5.54 p.m. emanates from the northeast corner of the warehouse, which is coming up here. The second plume at 6 p.m. is from the same source point that has a darker color here. The third plume appears on the northwest side of the warehouse at 6.07 p.m. And the final plume is developed from a spherical explosion located at the center of the warehouse at 6.08 p.m. Each phase indicates a possible transformation, either in location, chemical composition, or intensity. So at this point, we'd analyzed um, the available evidence on urban scale, the scale of the cloud against the city of Beirut. Um, this larger focus then provides clues to the smaller scale of the built environment and also the molecular level of the chemical composition of the materials themselves. Um, and this like spatial and temporal multi-scalar approach not only allows us to make visible um, the physical makeup of the warehouse, but also the sustained state negligence, which led to the disaster. So in their video report, MTV published a list of materials stored inside the warehouse. And this is likely from a 2015 state commissioned chemical forensic report, which is often referenced, but not in the public domain. So we set out to spatialize this list and determine rough volumes of each material. And if the combustion of that material could produce a significant plume. Referring back to Gareth Collett's suggestion that cloud color differentiates materials burning, we could start to determine the spatial layout of the interior, giving us a position for the white plume to the northwest of the building, the black plume to the northeast, the spherical explosion at the center of the warehouse. And according to Gareth Collett, they could have emanated from the combustion of fireworks, tires, and ammonium nitrate respectively. As we move inside the warehouse, we lose the cityscape as a geolocation tool, and instead we have to seek out different markers. In order to bridge this gap, we started mapping the window patination from the exterior. We stabilized this footage to reveal the full extent of the warehouse, and from this and other sources close to eye level, um, we could 
build up and like determine precisely which windows were open and closed. So here's that analysis in elevation. And then using the bays, the roof beams and the windows, we could then precisely position each photograph in the space, revealing the layout of the interior. And as you can see here, the bay numbers visible in the ceiling confirmed our analysis. As mentioned in the video, this allowed us to map a total of 243 bags of ammonium nitrate in space. And given the direction of the photographs and the edges of the stacks, we can infer the remaining position of the, of the, position of the remaining 2,507 bags. And here's that analysis and plan. So this layout of combustible and explosive materials in proximity to haphazard, carelessly stored ammonium nitrate already highlights the state negligence which led to the disaster. And you can watch the uh, full in-depth video on our website. Uh, this is just quite a brief overview. So the investigation was published by Madamas, a media part, and was widely circulated in the public sphere. And what's like quite a dense um, analytical video has now gained nearly three million views to date, um, which kind of highlights the um, relevance of this. So this investigation will provide a benchmark to review or judge the state's report upon publication. And when that happens, we'll be ready to review their findings and possibly reopen the case. So with software widely accessible to designers turned from illustrative devices to analytical tools, it is possible to demystify state negligence and provide a benchmark at which to judge their own and often, very often, biased investigations. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kishan. Um, it was a very, very informative uh, presentation. Um, so uh, next up is uh, Noor Zorbi, who is um, a Lebanese architect and urban designer based in Lebanon. Uh, she is in charge of the mapping department at the Beirut Urban Lab, which is an interdisciplinary research space um, that produces much needed um, research on the urban fabric of Beirut. Um, so, Noor, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Philip, for the introduction. I'm actually the coordinator of the mapping team at the Beirut Urban Lab. I'm going to start sharing my screen. So hi everyone, my name is Noor Zoghbi Faris. I'm the coordinator of the critical mapping team at the Beirut Urban Lab. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the initiatives that the lab has taken in response to the Beirut Blast. And I'm also be, going to be focusing on the importance of critical mapping in our work. So I'll start off the presentation by introducing the lab and the work that we do. I'll then move on to talk about the Beirut Port Blast project. And I will finally end the presentation by explaining the research and mapping tools that we, do, we use. So the lab is actually a very collaborative interdisciplinary research space. And all our work aspires to promote just, inclusive, and viable cities. We actually go through a very thorough process of data collection, uh, data mapping, data visualization, in order to start noticing urban trends of the de development. Uh, in this map, for example, we actually visualized two sets of data. So the approved PCH loans and the luxurious apartments within municipal Beirut. As you can see, when you actually went through this process, you can start seeing an, uh, an urban trend of development where the PCH loans were actually in the lower income neighborhood in this heart of the city, where the luxurious apartments are actually on the peripheries of the city and high end neighborhoods. We're actually a group of 18 people, professors, researchers, and designers. We're a very multidisciplinary team, uh, and we come from various fields of architecture, urbanism, social sciences, and GIS experts. And all our projects actually work uh, across uh, seven thematic areas, which are listed here. And these are very general tracks, and there's overlap between them in most of our projects. And they're not set in stone. I mean, they, they develop over time. 
So moving on to the Beirut Port Bus project, uh, it works on, under the themes of urban recovery and critical mapping. And our recovery approach is actually uh, very different than most stakeholders on the ground, which are mostly doing quantitative and physical assessment of damages. Of course, the physical assessment is very important in order to understand the extent uh, of the physical damage to the city. But it's also important to monitor and understand the already existing urban trends that were already happening prior to the blast. As you can see here, uh, there's an alarming rate of vacancy, uh, vacant apartment, evicted apartments, and demolition permits within the city. And we, if we zoom in and focus on the port area, there's also, it's very evident that there's a lot of vacancy rate, ev eviction uh, and of apartments, demolition permits, which are also very high and which were intensified post-blast. It's also clear that there is also demolition permits for heritage buildings. Our recovery approach also ensures a very people-centered and inclusive recovery. And since the government isn't playing any central role of coordination, nor setting a clear visioning framework, a people-centered and inclusive recovery process becomes very challenging to establish. Uh, this is why at the lab, we actually uh, set uh, three tracks in order to reach this people-centered and inclusive recovery, in which we're working with various uh, partners in each one of these tracks. So the first track is the observatory of the reconstruction. Uh, the second track is a neighborhood scale recovery intervention. And the third track is the visioning of the city in the post pass period. I'll start out with the first track where it's actually comprised of three items, the platform of shared geolocalized information, the neighborhood profiles, and the mapping of actors and governance and funding mechanisms of the reconstruction. So the first item is actually the platform of shared ge geolocalized information, which is the basis of our observa observatory phase. Uh, this platform will include all data layers that we have uh, available on the various areas affected by the port. The aim is to facilitate the coordination between stakeholders to produce map, to do some data analysis, and to produce findings that can inform the public of the ongoing uh, reconstruction processes. It will also help us in setting a framework of urban recovery. So in the maps shown uh, here, it's the first uh, attempt at putting all the data we have available uh, on the areas affected by the port, like PCH loans, evicted apartment, demolition permits, heritage buildings, a public space, among others. So this platform will actually work in parallel to our already available BBG platform that provides data at the building scale. Uh, and the platform has our base map, our 3D model, uh, a building attribute map, a vacancy map, and a water map. It's a very extensive set of data that's available to the public and that can be accessible through our website. The building attribute map, for example, provide information on the uh, rooftop uh, solar panels, presence of commercial space on the ground floor, and number of apartments per building. The water map, for example, gives us information about the public water supply, uh, the volume of water purchase, and the water purchase. We give the opportunity for the user to interact with the map, to turn layers on and off, and to even click on data points in order to be able to get data regarding the specific building he's interested in. Our BBEG base map is the first complete uh, base map of municipal Beirut, and it includes layers from a, road, a clean road network, uh, parcels, a topography layer, uh, building footprints, um, green spaces and landmarks. Uh, this base map is actually accessible to our website and you can actually download the shape files from there. Actually, after the blast, we provided our base map to most stakeholders that are working on the ground, to various NGOs, to the army and to the Red Cross. And they were actually using our parcel ID that matches our base map to do some data collection. Uh, this will actually help us in the consolidation of the, uh, of the data into one platform and the coordination between uh, and amongst uh, stake stakeholders. So we're working with various partners on the observatory phase, uh, including Rice University, the Lebanese Order of Engineers and Arch uh, Architects, Human Habitat, Open Map Lebanon, and the NGO Nusanid. And I'll give you one example of a project where that's already available online, which is in collaboration with Rice University, and which uh, is the first damage assessment of the 
post blast Beirut. The next uh, step is the moving on to the neighborhood scale. We just finished the neighborhood profile of the six area, areas, Bashura, Badawi, Jaitewe, Karantina, Karmiz Zaytun, and Marib Khayil. And these reports provide indicators on housing, infrastructure, and public space. We're publishing these six reports very soon in partnership with ACTED and UNHCR. The final item in the observatory is the mapping of actor governance and funding mechanisms of the reconstruction. And the aim is to basically identify the potential opportunities to influence the decision-making process and make it people-centered and inclusive. Moving on to the next track, which is a neighborhood scale recovery intervention. This track is a very complex and multi-layered process, which includes, but is not limited to, to extensive, uh, an extensive set of surveys capacity building workshops within the community, shared information, visioning and participation in co-designing of the local recovery framework. And basically at the end, uh, the selecting of strategic sites of intervention within the community. Our pilot project is currently happening in Carantina, where we adopt a very uh, bottom-up, inclusive and people-centered approach. Some of the important steps that we're taking in this track among a, a very big list, is basically establishing entry points within the community. So we had a group of, of the lab going on the underground, doing extensive surveys, data collection, data analysis in order to submit findings. And finally, to select strategic sites of intervention within the community in order to propose uh, public spaces. Finally, the last track is the visioning of the city in the post class period, which is basically comprised of two items. The first one includes seven closed roundtable sessions that were already done in collaboration with Columbia World Project and the JSAP at Columbia University. These were a closed session, but the findings of these workshops will actually be brought to the public platform in City Debates 2021 this coming spring. And finally, a visioning exercise also took place with the, in collaboration with the Institut Francais du Proche-Orient and the MUPP MUD programs at AUB. I'll move on to talk about the research and mapping tools that we use at the lab. The process always starts with an extensive data collection or, or desk review of existing data. All the data actually is geolocalized and matched to the parcel IDs in our base map. This example is for the BBEG project, the platform I just showed you, where we had five teams that went on the ground and used uh, applications on the phone to collect the data, the collector and survey one, two, three where they input data and match it to our parcel ID on our base map. This becomes very easy to basically directly input the data on our base map and to visualize it. I'll give you one example of a data set that, that is from our BBEG project, which is the size of apartment. So by doing, going through this process, we were able to see that the smaller sizes of apartments are actually in the heart of the city in the lower income neighborhoods, and the larger apartments are in the peripheries of the city and the more uh, luxurious neighborhoods. Similarly to, similarly to the first map I showed you, by using these experimental methods and innovative tools of investigation, the critical mapping process led us to see these urban trends of development within the city. Another example of this is our COVID-19 response project, where we're mapping the response of, responses of various actors across the scales. All our data was, was geolocalized. You can see the actors in relation to the type of action that was taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic across the three scales of the Muhafaza, the Qadar, all the way down to the locality where the response was taken. So currently at, at the lab, we're actually using a lot of Esri GIS online tools for, the out, uh, for various outputs. For example, a dashboard in the case of the COVID, some story maps and some public uh, platform. This gives us the ability to actually map data across scales, to use it with infographs and indicators. And most importantly, we give the ability to the users to have access to our data and to basically interact with it. Lastly, we also visualize data in 3D and static as well as in animation. In this case, we're visualizing the number of floors in the uh, in municipal Beirut. So when all these research and mapping tools actually come together, we start visualizing the data in a way that enhances our recovery efforts and help us set forth a holistic, inclusive, and uh, people-centered urban recovery. Thank you very much for listening uh, and for having me. 
And I just want to emphasize that all the work shown today is the hard work of the amazing Beirut Urban Lab team. Thank you, Noor. Um, thank you for this amazing um, research. Um, and uh, um, yeah, um, the next next up is um, is Sensi, um, who is a fellow fifth year diploma student at DAA. Um, she's from Romania, and she will be presenting a competition submission for a memorial for uh, the blast um, that she developed with a small group of uh, other AA students. Um, so Sensi, uh, welcome. Um, Hello start. everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the other presentations. I have to mention I'm not an expert on Beirut, like all the other presenters that, um, yeah, that show their projects, but I'm on the side of those foreigners who are very moved by the event. So following uh, the opportunity of an international competition, together with some friends, one of which from Beirut, uh, we designed a small project which addressed the explosion. Um, so I'll show you our proposal. So I will present a project called Hearts of Stitch Curtains. Um, I will represent a collective voice today of um, my teammates as well. So together with, uh, I'm Sensi Mania, and together with Shaha Rafael, Simon Pietro Salini, and uh, Jeffrey Sheng Chin Wu, um, we participated in this international competition called Souls of Beirut. And our proposal is now shortlisted. Um, so this was um, a competition launched in the autumn of 2020 after the explosion by a multidisciplinary research community from Lebanon called Future Plus. Um, so coming from very different backgrounds, it was very important for us that Shaha Rafael was originally from Beirut. So we really try to understand the event through her recollections, what it meant, what it felt like to live after the explosion and how it was to participate in the rehabilitation of the city. So the brief of the competition actually asked for a memorial landmark and we were very cautious in responding too fast to this brief. And we really tried to base our proposal um, on the sources we had from Beirut. We actually came up with, with something that was sort of an anti-memorial. Um, from our understanding, Beirut was in need of uh, so much more at the time and of something of a different function. So this image um, that was taken inside of a home in Beirut was, a, was very important to the project, this curtain that protected the home and the family from the shattered glass. Um, this was a condition that we noticed happening all over the city from other footage that, we, that was recording during that time as well. So we wanted to give value to this moment. So the most important part of the project was the torn curtain that witnessed the explosion and kept its traces. Um, so the material that covers our structure is made of stitched curtains found um, after the explosion. Um, the curtains are collected from each neighborhood as, uh, of Beirut as a symbol of hope and rebirth. And that was the aim of the competition as well. Um, we understood Beirut as a city built from its ashes. So with a heavy history of destruction and reconstruction, um, the city was always, has always rejected the memorialization of its past struggles and instead has strived to move forward with hope. That was the message that we got from, um, from the brief of the competition. So the project seeks to challenge the notion of the memorial. Um, as more than a place for mourning. So what we imagined was something more pragmatic in a way, uh, was not um, one structure, but a series of structures that would be constructed in more neighborhoods. And the project seeks to provide a framework for the volunteering process, um, rather than being so solely a memorial. So it became very important to include in the proposal a network of community-led temporary structures that would also serve as gathering grounds for healing the people and the built environment. Some would be memorials, but some would, some would be offering food and medicine, and some would be offering storage for organizing materials and tools. So the hearts, uh, as we call them, are built from lightweight scaffolding. So they're very easy, easy to um, assemble and disassemble, and it's a minimal means. Um, and surviving curtains stitched together to form a 60 meter long membrane surrounding the circular pathways. And the scars recount the role of the curtain as this attenuator of bodily damage at the moment of the explosion. Um, so torn, scattered, forgotten, the curtains are joined together to form a healing shroud. So we wanted, yeah, as much as we could 
um, help with this, we wanted to offer at least a poetic gesture um, after the explosion. So as a memorial, um, the heart invites visitors to form a solemn procession along a circular path lined with flowers, notes, and letters of remembrance. And as a space for the people, the heart provides shelter for the distribution of food, medicine, and emergency aid during the recovery. And as a space for the city, the heart organizes activities around the building and repairing of the sites affected by the explosion from the sorting of rubble to erecting new homes. Um, so to conclude, the circular space becomes a beacon for the healing activities that until now informally took place in leftover areas of the city. So it is in fact a home for the volunteers which within which healing becomes a collective and proactive process that we understood was very important for the city. And the stitching of the curtains is envisioned as an act to unite neighbors to foster a sense of community. Um, the moment of raising the large curtain, the 60 meter long curtain on the scaffolding structure is a ceremonial reminder of the fight that is happening. And as Beirut heals from the explosion, the scaffolding would be gradually taken down and the curtain would be carefully folded and kept as a relic. So it would be actually um, um, kept and um, stored to remember the event and the collective efforts behind the recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Sensi. Um, thank you for this uh, very enjoyable proposal. Um, very people oriented, very sensitive, and um, not really romanticizing pain as other proposals uh, did, I feel. Um, so if um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please ask them in the in the Q and A section. Um, I'd like to, I think, pick up, pick up on um, on this last presentation. So um, this idea of um, of um, dispersing smaller interventions across Beirut to provide kind of care to the Lebanese population. In a way, Asensi, you um, mentioned this being um, temporary, um, and it's also a bit similar to what Sibyl was saying at the beginning. Um, so like be wearing of, of creating this, um, this, um, yeah, um, the state of NGOs basically. Um, but in a way, um, I feel like, um, I feel like having, having those interventions dispersed across Beirut, not simply across the different neighborhoods that were di directly affected by the, the, the port blast, um, having them dispersed across other neighborhoods that are not, uh, that are suffering from other types of crises. Um, do, I think that this does in a way, um, introduce uh, care to the population that is much, much needed in a way. So Sibyl was talking about, um, having initiatives, um, empowering the local community, introducing, um, introducing a political activism, um, and, um, things like that. So I feel, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I feel like these are in a way, um, although they are temporary, maybe there is, um, something that we could reflect on looking at those as being more than simply like very is simply like inscribed in this, um, emergency relief initiative to kind of introduce, um, introduce, um, a, a deeper, a deeper, um, um, need for change for the population. So, um, yeah, if, um, I'm, if someone, um, um, has, um, comments about this, um, um, maybe civil, um, about the, um, the role of those initiatives in terms of not simply providing care, uh, or like emergency relief, but, um, introducing change on a, on a, on a more, on a more uh, global, um, not global, um, on a more urban level, um, at least. Um, I don't know if, yeah. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, like these initiatives um, are, are here to basically uh, empower the, the people that they serve, right? The aim is to have an impact beyond just you know providing care, but to help people grow in general in order for them to, um, to be able to continue and, and grow even more even after they left it, like they, they participated in the initiative. And so this is kind of the aim of most of them, including 
um, Saudi, of course, but um, even the, the all, all the education-based um, initiatives, the kine, et cetera. So all of these initiatives are here to provide a more sustainable um, growth, I want to say, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Um, um, no, no, uh, uh, no, it is, it is answering the question. Okay. It's, um, um, it's also um, about the work of, of impact. Um, the fact that you are um, based abroad gives you this external approach to the to the to the crises in, in Beirut. Um, how does this kind of affect the work uh, that you do? How does this is this an advantage or or an inconvenience in a way? Um, does it give you like more perspective on things or um, yeah? Um, it's a good question. I think that. Um, so we do have some members that are based in Lebanon, but the biggest part of our community is actually based abroad. Um, I think the, I, I wouldn't say it's an advantage or a disadvantage. I think it's just that as a diaspora, we um, are able to take kind of a step back because we are not based in Lebanon. Um, I think that we are able in a way to, um, um, yeah, kind of, because the, these incident, I mean, the economic uh, slowdown, et cetera, don't affect us directly, which means that be, because we're abroad, that means that we're able kind of to um, take a step back and, and try to understand how we can help people who are affected by this in some ways. And I, I believe as well that um, because we're, we're based abroad, a lot of people feel that need to um, to help because they feel that they're, they're you know, so far away from their families, from their friends. And I and, and they are actually much more motivated in a way, you know, to give back to, to Lebanon and and to eventually drive change in order to come back later on. Uh, so I think that this uh, drive and motivation is really what kept people going and what pe kept people um, working. You have to understand that everyone is here on a volunteering basis, even us as um, founders and directors, we're all here on a volunteering basis. We all have day jobs. And so it's all about, you know, it's, it's really uh, seeing people give their free time for such causes is actually very heartwarming. And I think that, yeah, that's, that is the main um, driver. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the, in the Q&A section. Um, um, I think um, it's directed to, to all speakers, but probably more directly to Noor. Um, so in the context of humanitarian emergencies, um, does any of the speakers see expansions coming in the use of GIS mapping tools in the direct aftermath of indus industrial or natural disasters? Or will GIS mapping always be too specialized and require too specific skills to be used as an emergency response tool? Um, so in a way, how the, how how um, how wide, widespread can this use of um, of GIS be basically for for the population? Um, I think it's actually a very widespread, and it's actually an experimental process even for us at the lab. So we learn as we go, honestly, and it's I think it will really grow over time, um, and that it's the future. Mm -hmm. So everything is data nowadays. So. I think it's a very, very important tool in order to start thinking through the data, mm -hmm. both spatially and it gives you the opportunity also thinking about them in, in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be very widespread and used by the public in the coming decade. Yes, I think um, like speaking of data and uh, kind of more objective views, I think that in all the presentations, but especially in Noor and uh, Kishan's presentations, we see how they are very informative and they are very kind of data. Uh, they come from data. Uh, however, you know, maybe more subjective conclusions can always be uh, uh, pulled out of them, you know, and they can always be uh, uh, taken to, you know, create a specific position from the person making those investigations. I mean, Kishan uh, mentioned, you know, how terrible uh, government neglect is. Uh, Whereas his investigation was completely subjective, coming from data and videos, uh, sorry, objective, coming from data and videos, you know, and, and very, very uh, informative. Same with uh, nudes, you know, especially the, the map, you know, with all the different parties, how they kind of contributed in different areas. I mean, it, it's a kind of, you know, map of their uh, political strategies, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we know that um, these kind of tools are utilized by corporations for like asset management. Um, I spoke to someone the other day who has like created a global infrastructure of drones so that as soon as as soon as there's a disaster, corp companies can um, get footage of it and assess the damage. And these kind of tools are becoming more and more publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the moment, yeah, GIS and kind of uh, the ability to, the public ability to like utilize drone footage is kind of limited to a very select strata of, of um, like technically capable uh, citizens, but I think it's only going to filter filter in more. And I think these tools will then will, we we will be able to use them to like to demand accountability to to um, produce our own counter investigations. Um, and I think you'll just see that happen more and more um, as time goes on. Really. Um, picking up on this, uh, Kishan, maybe. Um, so you've made um, the map, the the three D model, and the and the research available for for an, as an open source, um, um, which is a great initiative. But then, how do you think that um, such in in in, investig in investigation, sorry, um, can be used in a legal framework? Because I know that a lot of the work that you do at forensic architecture. Um, ends up uh, being used in courts, either national or international courts. Um, in a way, how, what is the potential of such an analysis today um, to be used um, in, such, it's in such a context? Um. Um, yeah, so I think sometimes, like there's, there's a few ways that the kind of the projects uh, are brought to life. Like often, um, a media partner will approach us with a lot of kind of evidence that they can't spatialize or investigate further. They've kind of taken it to their limit. Um, and then we'll work with that. So then projects are kind of initially in the initial phase of their life produced for media. Um, sometimes lawyers will come to us and ask us to uh, work on a legal case with the, with the family. Um, and then the other time is kind of like a combination of the two. So it will start in, the project will start in the media. And then as it gains traction, will be brought, might, might bring to focus a certain issue, which then is, then makes its way into the legal forum. And then the video or the, the report will kind of take center, not center stage, but it will be referenced heavily in that kind of legal process. So Coming back to your question, um, it's hard to know now exactly how it's going to be used. I think, as I kind of mentioned, the, the most immediate way it can be used is to really, uh, to really provide that kind of benchmark at which to assess the, uh, the state's investigation when that does, uh, when that is released. Um, but we, yeah, we don't know. And I think that's, that's what happens with a lot of our investigations is mm. we kind of put the initial put the initial push behind it and it will have an afterlife much beyond that kind of first release. Um, so we're kind of ready for that when it happens. Okay. Um, and from what I understand, uh, this project was a collaboration between, um, so Forensic Architecture and Madame Masur which is an independent um, news outlet, um, online news outlet. Um, so how did this come to be? Like how, what was, what was in the intention behind uh, this collaboration? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean like, um, Madame Asso obviously on Lebanese, but it's really important for us to bring in experts, but also people a bit closer to the, to the event because I think we have to be really aware of our position yeah. as a London-based research agency. So we're always, we're constantly aware, like what, what can we really bring to this? Um, are we, are we adding anything? Um, is are our skills like necessary to bring to this case? Um, 
and we need we need that kind of like nuanced understanding that texture of mm. of somebody who's a lot closer to the incident to really inform yeah. inform the case. In this case, we had Madame Mass as the media partner, and they were doing a lot of the kind of traditional investigative journalism uh, type role. So, but that was like uh, finding sources, speaking to people, uh, try, being on the ground, um, getting us access to to like photos mm. from the interior. Um, which actually weren't in public circulation before while, while we were investigating it. Um, so without that kind of support, we would never have been able to get that evidence, that material up to, to analyse in the first place. And without us, they, they wouldn't be able to spatialise or analyse that evidence, right? Um, so it's really kind of like this mutual collaboration. I think that's partly the success of a lot of forensic architecture projects is being able to coordinate and bring in experts in different fields. So whether it's like an explosives analyst, a uh, media partner, uh, activists on the ground, and really try and create something out of that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, thank you very much for, for this investigation. It brings like, a lot of fresh air I feel for Lebanese that are not used to like a proper investigations and uh, fact-finding missions. Um, there's another question uh, by Dara in the Q&A um, about GIS. Um, so he asks, um, GIS dat data by virtue of how the data is collected and presented can be difficult to understand by people using the program. With its use comes uh, with its use comes uh, some interpretation, and I was wondering how these interpretations and their potential subjectivity can be difficult or rewarding. Um, so again, probably um, asking this towards uh, Noor or Kish. Um, I don't know who wants to answer this. Um, sure, I can I can start and then Kish can. So I think in all uh, maps there is some sort of subjectivity. Uh, but uh, GIS actually allows us to be pretty objective in the sense of just inputting the data and seeing spatially. And then the way we actually manipulate, uh, manipulate this data and visualize it uh, sometimes allows us to, to tell uh, different narratives and the, what we're trying to say and what we're trying to achieve within this map. So I think it's a process of uh, experimentation and each, um, and I think we need to find a, a balance between uh, the data as it is and being uh, objective or subjective mm -hmm. if that makes sense um and uh, again it's i think a process of experimentation and i really would encourage everyone to just um that was interested with data to just go in the software and start experimenting and uh, using the online tools that are available so just searching through google everything is out there uh, in order to visualize your data and try to see what the data is telling mm -hmm. you um, yeah, and and the research that you do with uh, with uh, Beirut Urban Lab is actually very very interesting and very useful for I feel um, everyone in the in the field of architecture and urbanism. Um, I had I had a question also for you, Noor. Um, so um, you in your presentation you talked about um, empowering these bottom up approaches, um, bottom up initiatives. Um, as much as possible, especially when it came to the Beirut uh, Relief Initiative after the blast. Um, so um, how how did um, the organization between those different uh, initiatives happen? And um, how does the basically the top down approach that the that the army um, took afterwards, like a few days after after the blast, affect and influence those um, those bottom up um, approaches, um, basically. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about um, the pilot project that we're doing in Carantino. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, mostly it's actually being in the community and understanding what the people need, and yeah. to really try to reconcile the people with the place, mm -hmm. rather than just. Uh, what the army is doing is basically trying to see what the extent of the, the damage is and how to physically repair it. So our approach is to basically go on the ground, understand what is happening, what the people need, and basically work with them in order to set a visioning framework for the recovery. 
And this is what our team in the Quarantina is doing. And they're doing a great job to basically understand what the community needs in order to basically then select sites of intervention and promote public space within the community. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, if there's any other question uh, from the public, um, please ask it or them um, before we end this uh, session. Um, um, so yeah, maybe a last question from me to Sibyl. Um, so how, so you've talked about the different initiatives that Impact Lebanon um, uh, kind of parents. Um, so whether it's like Wishit Nazar, uh, Saudi, uh, Juzuri, etc. cetera. Um, how, how do these initiatives emerge and um, how does impact, how do they come together and how does impact um, like help them uh, happen basically? Um, yeah. yeah, of course. So um, basically at impact, we really believe in the grassroots model where the communities are the, the community itself is the, the members of our community are the one that generate these, these ideas. So we have a Slack channel, a Slack workspace where a lot of people interact with one another. And from time to time, there is an interest in a certain idea. It is um, brought up there. There's conversations that start happening. The reason why it's starting on the Slack channel is because of um, the fact that our members are based a bit everywhere in the world. So it's the best way for them to communicate despite you know, time differences, et cetera. And so when an idea is picked up, when there is interest, um, we, we start helping them when, on different uh, fronts. So we help them on um, mobilization. So bring more people on board, um, helping them, you know, um, get more volunteers where, where they have, you know, skills that are needed. There's a um, partnership. So we, we help them through our networks of partners um, in order for them to reach the right partners to develop their ideas, marketing. So we provide them with the um, first um, IL, you know, social media channel and also help them with their branding, uh, develop their own social media channels, their own marketing strategy, etc. cetera. Um, there's, um, what, am I, what did I talk about? And, and there's finally um, helping them a bit as well with a, a bit of funding, depending on the initiative and depending on, you know, what the needs are. Uh, so these are the different um, areas we help our initiatives in general. And obviously, um, I think one of the big strengths um, within the community is because we have 300 people all around the world, that also means that we have people who are experts in different domains and subjects. And therefore, whenever they have also a need, um, we can always put them in, in touch with an expert for advice, um, you know, experts within the community in general, and everyone's always super eager to learn. So there's all of those aspects that we help the initiatives with. Okay. Um, great, thank you. Uh, a few questions came in. Um, so from Javier. I think, yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, you know many of the questions being asked are very good questions. Uh, I imagine uh, if the speakers uh, want to answer them, go ahead. Um, but I think many of them uh, will be tackled uh, in the coming sessions. So uh, yeah, so please, I leave it to the speakers. But yes, Philip, if you want to uh, read them out. Um, no, I'll let the, the, the speakers uh, yeah, decide or pick. Um, I can answer one of the questions that's addressed to the lab uh, on how we're actually communicating with people to ensure uh, an inclusive recovery. Uh, so as I was saying, we're actually going on the ground uh, First, there's an extensive data collection done by surveys. And we have our teams we're doing a lot of uh, community workshops, so working with uh, community, both uh, the stakeholders and the actual locals in the community, uh, and make them part of the visioning of the recovery and seeing what the need of the people are in order to reconcile the people with the place. Um, in order to have an inclusive recovery process and to select the strategic sites of interventions that are more of a public space rather than just physical uh, repairs to the buildings. Okay, thank you, Noor. Um, if um, there's nothing else, um, I'd like to uh, end the session. 
Um, but before finishing, um, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, join again at the closing, um, at the closing uh, conversation, all the speakers and the guests as well. Um, so yes, thank you very much for your presentations, everyone. It was really, really interesting. Um, so yes, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, I think it's very nice to see all the work that you guys have done. It's very nice to see work done in Beirut. Uh, and also interest coming from outside of Beirut, from the diaspora and people who are not Lebanese, but feel kind of a sense of duty or responsibility uh, in the face of injustice. Um, yeah, so now we will uh, take a 19 minute break and we will start again at 11.30. Um, yeah, with uh, a session chaired by Judy Diab uh, about the activism and in-situ work that has been done in reconstruction and also uh, relief efforts. Uh, but before that, I will, like during the break, I will share my screen uh, to show, um, kind of have a musical interlude between uh, the sessions uh, that is kind of offered by Alent's uh, music. <laughs> 